Hey there, how you all doing? This is uh, Dr. John back here again um, with another episode of Ask the Doctor, Ask Dr. John. And I've got a couple of things that I want to talk about today. One of those is headaches. And uh, since they afflict a very high percentage of the population and we do a great job of dealing with them. So we're going to go into some detail there. And I have a few questions to answer before that. We got some great ones from uh, some of the listeners, uh, they checked in with a couple things. Before we do that, uh, Catherine is going to talk about one of your favorite things. Yes. So I am going to be talking about watermelon, um, a nice summer treat and the benefits of it. So in Chinese medicine, um, fruits and vegetables and even meat have different healing qualities and properties. And what's great about watermelon is that it is most of the seasons are in the summertime and it is a cooling fruit. And so what that means is it will help clear, it will help cool summer heat. Um, and so this will help to nourish the fluids in the body, promote urination and one thing with heat, especially summer heat, is it can cause constipation because um, the heat dries everything up and watermelon can help with that. And so watermelon is great for many different things. If you do have a weak digestion, you'll want to eat this um, in fair amounts and small amounts because it is also cold in nature and cold vegetables and fruit plus raw fruits and vegetables are not the best for a weak digestion. Cool. All right. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. So uh, get your watermelon. The um, from a Western standpoint, we know now the Chinese were so sophisticated, you know, and I uh, I'm not Chinese. I have no ax to grind here. But the things that they discovered thousands of years ago are, in my opinion, completely mind blowing. I have a book right behind me over here called The Genius of China, which I could take a show and go through 10 pages at a time and you'd be blown away. They were making testosterone and human growth hormone pills hundreds and hundreds of years ago. They were doing inoculations uh, uh, in the little after 1000 AD. They were treating thyroid disorders in 618 AD better than 99% of doctors are treating it now. They completely mapped out the neurological system your nerves uh, over 2,500 years ago. They completely mapped out your circulatory system over 2,000 years ago. And another thing that they did is that they classified all foods uh, and many other things by many different qualities, amongst them thermal qualities. So for example, some foods are are hot, some are warm, some are neutral, some are cool, and some are cold. And that's the same with herbs. And so the herbs are classified in the same way. And so if you've got a really hot condition, you might want some really cold herbs uh, in the Chinese way of treating, which is actually very similar to the Western way of treating uh, and exactly the opposite of home homeopathic. So it's very fascinating. Uh, all of those work if you, you know, do them properly uh, in the right condition. But the Chinese then identified different colors of foods that were most valuable at different seasons and most valuable for different conditions. And the red, yellow, orange fruits and vegetables they knew were very, very powerful for increasing the chi flow and affecting the lungs, for example. Uh, watermelon, with, the, with being red, uh, was one of those foods. Now, we now know that watermelon is the richest food in lycopene. And lycopene is an incredibly powerful antioxidant, very good for the prostate, um, very good for the heart, very good for the eyes, plus a whole list of other antioxidants. Plus, it's got a lot of good fluids in it. And one of the questions that I've been asked today, I'm going to go right into that right now, is this is one of, from one of our favorite people. I, I don't announce people's names in the layout unless they ask me to, but health impact of inorganic salts versus organic sodium from plants like celery, tomatoes, et cetera. And yes, um, 
the organic compounds are much more easily absorbed and utilized by the body in most cases. So you'll see supplements, magnesium, potassium, et cetera. If you have something that's a pure um, inorganic, I'm going to call it salt, like sodium, I mean, magnesium oxide, it's great to clean you out. It's great for uh, before a colonoscopy, for example, but very little of that magnesium is absorbed. The body doesn't re recognize it as something that it wants to take in. And so different supplements or foods, which uh, where you have binding within the foods or the supplements, for example, with magnesium, Sometimes it will have it bound to threonic th acid for magnesium threonate, best form to penetrate the blood brain barrier, magnesium citrate, which is bound to citric acid. So this binding allows the body to accept it more e easily and utilize it better. Chromium picolinate, uh, zinc picolinate, et cetera. They're bound to picolinic acid. And so that binding makes it more readily available and more like a um, a natural product and the body will absorb it much better. Uh, then the question goes on to say, you've heard that it, the others can contribute to arthritis and other health problems. Yes. Particularly, um, you know, when we're talking about table salt, there are many, many different forms of what we typically call table salt, uh, sodium chloride. Now the, Salt that most of us grew up with, you know, in the iodized salt is heated to about 1200 degrees, which totally degrades it and turns it into a form that is very, very hard to utilize and absorb, but which can then actually increase arthritis, uh, cardiovascular risk, etc. Uh, the sea salts, which have a good combination of minerals in them are much, much healthier. And then if you get like the Himalayan pink sea salt, which if it's from true uh, Himalayan sources, and a lot of it's not, a lot of it's fake, but if you do, that will have the entire complex of minerals that are important for the human body in, and in a form that is much easier to absorb. Now, even easier than that is to get your salt, your sodium, your other minerals, from fruits and vegetables. Um, sometimes we actually can't do that though. There's just not enough in them, which kind of gets us to the next question on this list. Um, and her thing, uh, it says, i.e., is that is it that the plants are pre-digesting the rocks, making them bioavailable? Yeah, that's close enough. I mean, it's certainly not a good uh, chemical or biochemical uh, explanation, but I like it. Um, it's being brought in, it's being transferred, trans laded into forms that the plants need, which are what our bodies were trained, right? We were trained over time um, and selected to use those particular fruits and vegetables. So next question, is Camellia sinensis a super absorber of toxic environmental fluoride from soil, et cetera? And the answer, unfortunately, is unequivocally yes. So Camellia sin sinensis, all of the the plants that we call tea with caffeine, black tea, green tea, white tea, matcha tea, et cetera. Now there are infusions that are sometimes called tea, uh, which are not Camellia sinensis, but those are the non-caffeinated forms. And so Camellia sinensis is a super absorber for many things, not just fluoride, uh, the other many things are uh, part of what it makes it so powerful. It will absorb what's ever in the soil as the super absorber, meaning it's more powerful in a good way and more powerful in an unhealthy way. Uh, that fluoride does get condensed, bioaccumulated in the camellia plant. The older the leaves, almost all of it's over 99%, I believe, don't quote me, of the fluoride is in the leaves. Uh, again, it's pulled up from the soil. So if you have a fluoride-free soil, then you wouldn't have fluoride in the plant. But there's it's hard to find true fluoride-free soil. Uh, there are some Japanese teas that are grown in areas with lower fluoridation. So those are a little healthier. Um, but it does bioaccumulate. 
It is a problem. It's a problem for the pineal gland. It, it causes can cause fluorosis, which is an over hardening of the teeth. And in young children, young kids should never get teeth ever uh, because it can increase osteosarcoma risk, which is a bone cancer risk. And in adults, I don't really worry about that at that level. However, the fluoride levels from drinking tea uh, grossly exceed the maximum safety guidelines in most countries. There was one very large study that I read, uh, large like 50 pages, and quite a few people where they looked at tea drinking in the Republic of Ireland, which they're big, big tea drinkers, even more than China. They drink a lot of black tea and they were getting huge amounts of fluoride well over the recommended allowances. Now, on the other side of that, there are not a lot of illnesses that are clearly and absolutely attributable to that fluoride in their case. There are some suspicions, right? So I don't wanna um, make it sound like it's not an issue. Um, I personally still drink Camellia sinensis. I think um, that the benefits to me outweigh the risks, but again, it's like anything else. It depends on age. It depends on the sex of the person involved. It depends on their size, et cetera, probably even genetics. For me, I drink it. I would never give it to younger people. And with people that um, show any signs of fluoride uh, sensitivity, I would not give it to them. Okay, so thank you for those questions. I appreciate that tremendously. Um, let's see. And so, again, so some of the problems um, with fluoride, you get actually tooth discoloration as possible. You get what's called fluorosis, which are uh, white spots on the teeth. That's more pronounced in younger uh, kids, even just from drinking water, it's a problem. Um, you know, very high intake of fluoridated water, according to many dentists, actually, actually weakens the enamel. Again, that's a debate, but many dentists don't like it for that. Skeletal weakness um, can have pretty high levels of damage uh, to the skeletal muscles if there's too much ingested. Uh, acne, uh, acne risk is increased in uh, fluoride drinkers, there is a definite decrease in IQ amongst younger kids, and there is an increase in passivity in older people. So uh, again, I think it's a real bad thing, but I still drink a little green tea. So, you know, you got to make those choices for yourself. Okay, so I'm going to now turn to um, headaches. That was the an email, a newsletter that Catherine sent out today. And so I'm just gonna stay with that topic. Uh, this isn't gonna show full screen. I had it as full screen, but it's being a little recalcitrant at the moment. So uh, the title of this is, which migraine are you? Now, as you know, not everybody has migraines, so it's not a great question. You could be the, I'm not a migraine person, uh, totally possible. Um, but in Chinese medicine, when someone comes in and says that they have a headache, we're going to do the workup a little bit differently than your medical doctor. Now, if you have a good medical doctor, they're going to ask you a lot of important questions. Uh, do you have any triggers? Uh, how long does it last? Do you get nausea? Do you get auras, et cetera? However, we want to know, we're going to ask all of those questions for sure, but we're going to want to know temporal you know, is it worse in the morning, worse in the afternoon? Is it worse with stress? Uh, what part of your head? And that's a question that is a little less important to Western medical doctors and very important to us. Every location on the head signifies to us a different type of headache. And so it's very, very important. Now, migraines affect about 10% of people worldwide. Now, and unfortunately, a lot of people with migraines and even just general headaches don't realize that it increases risk factors for a whole, whole range of problems. Uh, for migraines, it, it doubles the risk of stroke. 
uh, which is a pretty significant problem uh, because migraines are actually vascular in nature. It's a blood flow issue. Now, there may be muscular tension involved. There may be lots of things, but ultimately, it's a blood flow issue, and that makes it a lot more dangerous. Now, typically, migraines are one-sided. Now, they may go back and forth, but they're typically on one side at a time. Not always, but usually. The, uh, the pain can vary from so severe uh, makes people non-functional to actually no pain at all. They're now finding many, they're still calling them migraines, but will just show up with auras and change in vision. Others will be just with nausea and no pain in the head. But in general, it's pretty severe pain. Often you'll see uh, visual disturbances. Uh, that's problematic particularly if you see what's called scintillating scotoma. And in scintillating scotoma, if you've ever had a, a newer TV that was starting to go out, you'll notice that some of the little dots, the pixels, aren't working correctly. And you'll see these kind of squiggly lines. Well, in migraines with visual disturbance where you have scintillating scotoma, those are a big, big concern for me. Uh, Auras or changes in blood flow at all are to me very, very significant because if there's an aura, that increases the risk factor in general. And that's whether you have pain or not. Now, um, they're uh, easily migraine with aura or are at more than double the risk of stroke. Now, migraine sufferers who smoke are at triple the risk of smoke. So if you have migraines, you should not even be near anybody that's smoking. Also, and this is really overlooked, migraine sufferers who both smoke and use birth control are seven times more likely to, to suffer a stroke. Seven times. So if you're on birth control and you have migraines, your chance of risk, uh, your risk of migraine is higher. If you smoke and have migraines, your risk of stroke is higher. And if you smoke and use birth control, it's through the roof, seven times higher. Um, now, the problem, one of the problems with migraines is every few years, they think they've figured out what the triggers are. I was very fortunate. In my 20s, I used to get horrific migraines. I mean, lock me in a pitch black room with no sound for two days, uh, severe nausea. I figured out what my triggers were and knock on wood, where is it right there? I have not had a migraine since my mid twenties and I don't ever want one because they're horrible. Some of the more common triggers are humidity, changes in, in uh, air pressure. You know, we have a high pressure coming in or a low pressure, lack of sleep or disturbed sleep obviously stress, diets that are high in sugar, fat, preservatives, nitrates, MSG, alcohol. Coffee and black tea are interesting. Um, while people that drink coffee can have higher rates of migraine, one of the most common causes of migraine is to stop drinking coffee. For example, I get people that are coming in and they're in agony and uh, they said, yeah, I spent all weekend in bed. I'll say, what time did you have your morning coffee? Well, I didn't. I felt too bad. Well, what time do you normally have your morning coffee? First thing in the morning and then I have a second cup. And so the lack of caffeine can also, in fact, it's even more common, can be a trigger for migraine because the caffeine causes constriction of the blood vessels in the neck and the and the brain and the head and so when you don't have it those vessels can expand and when they can expand they can uh, then press on the nerves and then also cause differences in blood flow so if you're susceptible to migraines keep your caffeine consumption very very regular um, but again no matter what the trigger is classic migraines usually will have a visual aura sensitivity to light, sound and smell, and then bouts of nausea and vomiting. So, so again, um, big, big problem. If you have those, do not 
overlook them, get treatment immediately. And I've mentioned a couple of the long-term problems with stroke. You also get cardiovascular disease. You get an increase in C-reactive protein levels, et cetera. So this is a pretty big, big problem. Uh, lots of things have been tried to um, eliminate migraines, and I'm going to go through a few of those. Uh, but first, um, again, migraines with aura for more than a, more than a, particularly if it's more than a few seconds, again, 50 to 70 percent higher risk in other women. And uh, also uh, migraines have been associated with brain lesions. Uh, at least every couple of months, I'll read an MRI from one of my patients and it will indicate migraine induced demyelination. So myelin is the protective covering around your ner nerves. When that degrades, the nerves can touch just like wires. Uh, it's what happens in multiple sclerosis. And then you start sending the wrong messages out. So demyelination means that not myelin sheath is actually being degraded. Uh, again, here we're having uh, poor blood flow to the area. So we're getting poor oxygenation. We're getting poor myelination, and eventually that will show up uh, in film studies of the brain. So that's really a very bad thing. And there was a study done in Netherlands uh, quite a while back uh, showed much higher levels of brain uh, lesions, so big deal. And in fact, it generally was hard to distinguish between the brains of people with chronic migraines or migraines with aura. Uh, from transient ischemic attacks or TIAs, little mini strokes, right? Because the same thing's happening. Uh, they're like, they're both having repeated little mini strokes because they're associated with insufficient oxygen and they both put people at risk for major stroke, whether it's TIA or um, migraine demyelination. So pretty big problem. Now, in some of those studies in the Netherlands, uh, they used... Um, pretty high doses of CoQ10 and got pretty good uh, reductions. Now, in terms of migraine triggers, as I mentioned, can be so many different things. Uh, I have a couple of patients that usually get triggered, uh, like if they're sitting in their living room and a car goes by and the light glints off their windows and flashes in their eyes, often that'll trigger a migraine. Um, different foods or studies from the 60s, early 60s, uh, with lists of the most likely migraine uh, causing foods. Uh, synthetic fragrances are a big problem. I know people, if they walk into a room that has one of those plug in air fresheners, instant migraine. Um, but one of the things that gets overlooked a lot is uh, blood sugar problems. I had a patient come in about my age, um, early 70s. And she didn't even come in for this, for her migraines. She'd given up on that. She came in for something else. But when we got around to her migraines, she was having them daily and they were pretty much uh, making it impossible for her to live huge amounts of her life happily. And so in questioning her, you know, it, it took me two visits before it became really clear. I said, I think you have hypoglycemia. And when you're hitting those hypoglycemic levels, then your migraines kick in. And she said, look, I've been to so many doctors. Somebody would have noticed that. I said, well, I still recommend that you go back to your doctor and have them do a, um, a study for hypoglycemia. So she called and said, you know, my doctor just laughed at me. She's not going to do that study. I said, okay, I highly recommend that you do it. So she did. There are several levels on a blood test that can come back. You get highs, you get lows, and occasionally you get a flag, and occasionally it's so severe that the lab will call me. Now, that only happens maybe once a year. The lab called me for her and said, "Her get do not let her drive. Her blood sugar is 34. She could go into a coma at any moment and probably has no idea what she's doing. Uh, after that, her doctor actually did uh, recheck that, find that she had pretty significant or severe um, hypoglycemia. And indeed, that was what was triggering her headaches. So anyway, fortunately, we got a good result there. Um, but it's often overlooked. So if you get migraines, uh, 
Uh, be sure to keep your blood sugars level. Absolutely stay away from meats with nitrites, no MSG. Uh, and stay away from caffeinated beverages unless you're really hooked, um, et cetera. So those are some of the some of the uh, triggers. Now, things that you can do to deal with your migraines. Let's see, here we go. Uh, Chinese medicine, as I mentioned, has its own subdivisions based on etiology and symptomatology. So what causes them, what brings them on, and what are the symptoms like? So what part of your head, for example, or what other symptoms do you get with it? Now, the Chinese say that the wind is the leader of the hundred evils. So pretty much everything is a, uh, caused by wind. But you have to know what they meant by that. Uh, again, it's a translation. Some of it was the wind. Just being in the wind is a problem. But also they knew that most bacteria and viral illnesses were spread through the air. So they said, yeah, it's the external wind. It's coming into your system from the outside. Um, and so that's uh, talking about the forces of energy that are affecting us from outside of the body. And uh, the, again, that can be something literally as simple as true wind. You're out in the wind and you get chilled, but also it can be viruses, uh, bacteria, et cetera. Now with external wind he headaches, um, those can take a variety of forms and locations. Often it's more the whole head involved. Uh, sometimes it's the back of the head, sometimes it's the front, depending on how much the sinuses are affected. The second and really the biggest factor for most um, bad migraines are liver excess. Now, I'm not going to go into all the functions of liver from a Chinese standpoint today. Uh, I've done that on several other um shows. So uh, I highly recommend that you go check them out because they're very relevant to this. One of the factors in liver pathologies is um, high stress will cause liver depression or liver chi stagnation or both. And when that happens, then women get PMS, uh, everybody gets headaches. It's uh, really a problem. Now, Women are three times more likely to experience med uh, migraines, and that's mostly due to the hormonal fluctuation. Um, the liver also regulates menstruation, so migraines related to cyclical hormone changes generally fall into that category, too. Um, and when it's associated with liver chi stagnation, it's more of an expanding, a distending feeling. It's often triggered by stress or relationship to the menstrual cycle, often with liver depression, uh, just before the menstrual cycle starts or the menses starts, uh, that's when the liver chi stagnation will really kick in severely and you'll get these horrible, horrible headaches. Um, sometimes you get heat accumulation in the liver also, and those liver fire type migraines, uh, you'll get kind of red eyes, burning eyes, Sometimes hard to breathe, but the biggest feature is irritability. You just, you can't stand being in your own skin and anything around you will irritate the heck of you, out of you. Now, the liver is in Chinese medicine, a wood organ um, and the spleen and stomach um, are earth organs. And so there's a condition called earth assailing wood or earth attacking wood or an earth wood disharmony where you'll see the liver energy, this intense energy actually affects the digestive system. And that's where you get the nausea, um, uh, the changes in appetite, the vomiting, et cetera. Often this liver fire type, you'll also have maybe a flushed face, uh, high blood pressure, sometimes some ear uh, ringing. So those kind of go together. Now, the next one I'm going to talk about is chi and blood deficiency. And there are many reasons why you can have deficiencies, particularly in our culture. When I was in China working in clinics, I saw a fraction of the deficiency that I see here. There I saw a lot more heat. Here I see a lot more deficiency. And so for example, my patients that literally cannot get out of bed 
on day two or day three of their menses, uh, it's a blood deficiency and usually with a chi deficiency. And literally there's not enough oxygen. There's not enough nutrients getting to their brains. It's, you know, I've had to come in and treat my staff that have had this. Literally, they were lying on the floor in a fetal position and I had to give them herbs just so they could get home. And fortunately, there's some very, very specific, very powerful herbs for this chi and blood deficiency. Um, so anyway, thank goodness we have that. The next one is blood stasis or blood stagnation. Now, with any, there's a saying basically, um, free flow equals no pain, no free flow equals pain. So if there's any stagnation, it can be fluid, it can be dampness, it can be cheese stagnation, or it can be blood stagnation or food stagnation. If any of those is stagnant, there will be pain. There's no question about that. And those can tend to be the most severe migraines. And this is really consistent with the West, right? Here you've got the blood, there are spasms often in the blood vessels, and the blood is literally not moving. It is literally stagnant or static. And these are the worst headaches. These are sharp, lancinating pain, usually in a fixed location because the blood is stuck in a fixed location. So the chi and blood deficiency is just, everything's gonna be deficient. And it just feels like your head is hollow and empty and you can't function. With blood stagnation, it's a specific location. And so the more specific and the more pain, the more danger, in my opinion. These tend to be really steady. Uh, sometimes they're associated with memory loss, sometimes with palpitations. And this has got to be treated right away. Sometimes there'll be a history of head injury. Uh, Post-COVID, these are very common because of the microclotting that occurs. Uh, also, post-COVID injuries, again, because of the microclotting that occurs. And you can actually see on live blood analysis, uh, the blood being hypercoagulable. It's literally just stuck and not moving. So this is a, this one's horrible. And then retention of cold, damp, phlegm. And um, with these, you'll get the foggy headedness with the headache. Just don't wanna function, uh, don't have any energy. Uh, you may have some dizziness. You may actually get some phlegm buildup, like your sinuses, et cetera. But you also might get some edema and some swelling in the tissues. This one is often worse when there are temperature changes or changes in barometric pressure. Because when the barometer, when we have low pressure, then literally our tissues swell. We don't think about that. We don't notice it, but they do. They actually swell because there's less pressure. And so you get pressure that wasn't there before. If you get a high pressure area around you, it literally squeezes your tissues and can cause a very, very similar type of problem. So these are, again, the different the different types, right? Um, in terms of location, uh, headaches that are in the frontal sinuses are generally associated uh, with the stomach in Chinese medicine, some with the lungs. If they're in the temples, it's generally a gallbladder headache. And most migraines are uh, gallbladder headaches. You notice people will actually get a little bit green often and green's the color of the gallbladder. So they go together. Liver headaches are often on top of the head <coughs> and headaches from dehydration or stress are often at the back of the head. Um, so again, by telling the quality of the pain, the location of the pain, when it occurs, we know how to treat it. And there are very powerful herbal formulas to treat each one of those different conditions. Or of course, we can do acupuncture for it. And often we'll do acupuncture as the initial treatment uh, to help people get out of pain. Catherine's actually quite magical. Uh, she had, we accidentally discovered that the treatment she was doing, she was doing a facial type treatment for inflammation and I had three or four patients come into me after seeing her and they said, and I would say, hey, how are your headaches? Um, I don't have them anymore. What do you mean you don't have them? You've had them for years. Yeah, as soon as I saw Catherine, they went away. So she's now our headache specialist, particularly migraine headaches. She gets great results. 
um, really works the head and the front of the head. Now, for chronic headache pain, there are a few things you can do. Uh, one is biofeedback. And biofeedback has been shown. And again, none of these work for all headaches because they're all, you know, they're, they, they'll work for the ones that they treat. But as I mentioned, there are several different types. So you have to know which one to apply. Um, so the biofeedback and the effects of biofeedback are about comparable to many of the drugs used for migraines. Uh, the migraine drugs, especially up the most recent category that's being used, all had very significant side effects. Uh, so if you can do biofeedback instead of taking the drugs, that's a big benefit. Um, Albrecht Mossberger, who's an MD, um, uh, did studies and showed that medical acupuncture is at least as effective as blood pressure medication, such as beta blockers, for migraines. Uh, melatonin, uh, two-thirds of the study uh, who took melatonin before going to bed every night for three months uh, said the number of migraines they experienced dropped by 50%. Now, not everyone can take uh, melatonin. I found about 10% have just horrific, intense technical or dreams. About another 10% feel like they've been drugged the next day. But it's something to try. Magnesium may be the single best. It's at least one of the three best uh, treatments uh, for migraine. Uh, magnesium deficiency, uh, it's been estimated that 80% of the population is magnesium deficient. Magnesium runs so many processes. We could sit here for a week and talk about them. But if in, when in doubt, take some extra magnesium. The only side effect from that is if you get too much, you'll get some loose stools. Um, diet, again, we mentioned you want to make sure you're not consuming triggers. So sometimes a little food diary, uh, diary helps. Um, chiropractic helps some people, particularly upper cervical uh, chiropractic treatment. Uh, doesn't help everybody, uh, but some people it does depending on um, the, the, again, the cause of the migraine. And the biggest thing that I'm finding is, and this has been shown in the recent studies, is that migraine is a disorder of chronic sympathetic dysfunction. The sympathetic nervous system has been dysregulated and it's running rampant and it's filling you full of stress hormones. Those stress hormones increase inflammation and change blood flow patterns. So ultimately, that's really, really the, the biggie there. Um, a couple of other things you could try, 5-HTP, um, right? 5-hydroxytryptophan, uh, naturally occurring compound in your brain, and also can be attained from griffonia, which is an herb. And we know that if serotonin is low, you have more pain. If serotonin is increased, you have less pain. 5-HTP is a precursor to serotonin. Uh, and in a clinical trial of 5-HTP against a prescription drug, they had the same level of effectiveness, but the 5-HTP helped people long-term, the drugs made them worse. And the, the, uh, in that study, they used 50 milligrams of 5-HTP one to three times a day. Okay. Another uh, trial that was done in Philadelphia at, at Thomas Jefferson University, they gave 150 milligrams per day of CoQ10 for three months. After, after that three months, about 60% of the pub, uh, subjects reported that their days without migraine was double what it had been before. So that's kind of cool. There was a Swiss study that replicated uh, the same results. So CoQ10 is a superior antioxidant. Um, and if you couple it with magnesium, they are a great, great couplet. Um, also, you can do um, a combination of vitamin B6, B12, and folic acid, which dramatically actually uh, decrease the frequency, severity, and disability from migraine headaches. Now, we know that that B vitamin combination lowers homocysteine levels. 
Homocysteine is a marker of inflammation and poor B vitamin utilization. And people with higher homocysteine levels have dramatically higher risk for dementia. So this may be part of the reason that there's such an increase in dementia risk uh, with the migraine sufferers. So again, 28 million people are experiencing frequent migraines, and sometimes that can be as simple as taking a vitamins and mineral supplement. Um, now, one of the things you can do, and there are uh, locations all around the Bay Area where you can get intravenous uh, infusions or injections of magnesium and vitamin B6. They usually add other things, but this is a known migraine stopper. It'll just stop migraines in its tracks. Um, and again, you need to double check why it's all happening. But if you're desperate, you can call one of the infusion sites. Um, we use a company called Vivify, V-I-V-I-F-Y. I love those people out in Walnut Creek. Uh, and we use them for infusion therapies. So if not, if you're not going to do that, you could do 200 milligrams of magnesium citrate twice a day, 200 milligrams of vitamin B6 twice a day, and then add three fever few capsules twice a day, and then a multi, multivitamin and mineral. And that should give you pretty good coverage. Um, the... Um, a study that was done on what's called transformed migraine, which is a common type of chronic daily headaches, uh, in Korea, and they, this was done in Korea. And they, in this study, the avoidance of caffeine and alcohol had no effect on the migraine status, but stopping painkillers and regular exercise got rid of most of their headaches. Okay. Most of their headaches. Now, a well-known combination to stop migraines in terms of herbs is the combination of feverfew and butterbur. Uh, there are dozens of them online. I can't speak to which ones are the best, uh, but they've been used with great success for a long time. The key is they usually don't kick in right away. It usually takes 60 to 90 days before the butter burr and fever few really start to do the job, but I've seen it be extremely effective. So now I want to mention a couple of new treatments that I'm seeing that are working really, really well. One is monoclonal antibodies, and these are injections usually once a month um, uh, for, again, they're monoclonal antibodies. Um, and they have a tremendous success rate against uh, migraines. The one I'm most familiar with is one called AIMOVIG, A-I-M-O-V-I-G. Um, that's the one I saw almost exclusively for a while, but it causes a little more constipation. So a lot of people are now using one called Emgality, E-M-G-A-L-I-T-Y. And I'm seeing really, really uh, great results. They attach to the callus, calcitonin gene related peptide, they call it. And that can impact migraines, migraines by widening the blood vessels in the brain, which sounds like a good idea, whether you have migraines or not, but you won't get it if you don't have migraines. But so I'm feeling pretty good about what I'm seeing with this uh, category of drugs. Uh, I've seen it happen very quickly, they say uh, maybe three to six months. Most of my patients have been migraine free after their first treatment. And it's way, way better, way safer, and way more powerful than do using the old tryptan drugs, which cause severe rebound. Last thing I want to talk about is a device. Uh, it's called a cephaly, C E F A L Y. It's about $400. And it's a device that you literally put on your head and you use it for about 20 minutes at a time. And in one clinical study, 79% of acute migraine sufferers saw pain relief within one hour. So that's pretty amazing. And 32% experienced complete freedom uh, from migraine um, problems. So it's really easy to use. Uh, like I said, it's about $400. I have a 
few patients that use it. I would say 70, uh, 65 to 70 percent report very, very uh, good results. Okay, so what I want you to do is I want you to think over the next few days or the next week of any questions that you have about headaches and or migraines and or treatments, and I want you to send them to me. I'd love to talk more, but this kind of gives you a whole general outline. Um, and Chris, one of the things I found is that migraines with aura, the one benefit is they lower dementia risk. So that's kind of cool. At least there's some benefit to those migraines with auras. So awesome. I was thinking about you. Um, so that's all I'm going to talk about today. I want to thank you for your questions and for your uh, encouragement, tremendous encouragement that I'm getting and for listening in. Again, it's no point in doing this without you. And I want to thank you. I want you to be happy, be healthy, and I'll be back next week. Bye-bye.